this is the timeline view that shows everything that's happened during the attack and the defense. On the left you have the attacker view and on the right you have the defense view. So up here at the top you can see it, the attacker begins serving up its malicious website. The unsuspecting user clicks on the link to go to the site and then is exploited. The Java exploit causes a couple of snort alerts to fire. So the defender checks the virus total reputation of the attacker address and then pulls the processes from the host that it saw going to that address. It checks the reputation of those processes as well as detonates them in Cuckoo Sandbox. Um, finally, the attacker begins to move laterally within the enterprise, which causes the defender to become confident enough to decide to take action. So it will block the attacker address and reboot the non-mission critical host. Your initial login into the social interface will bring you to this home page. On the right side here is where you can click to access the list of courses of action stored in this enterprise's Solcher database. The most recently transmitted sticks message is shown here, broken into two separate items which represent the two COA items that Enterprise 1 shared with Enterprise 2. Clicking on the first item shows this specific object's associated observables, and by using the sticks to HTML feature of the tool, you are able to see a more structured view of the details of the object observables. The expanded view shows the actual snort rules that were passed, with the course of action type being monitoring for these observables. Going back to the course of action catalog, the same thing can be done with the second object as well. Here you see the attacker IP variable that was passed which could hold the IP address of the attacker game from the other enterprise's defenses with the course of action set to perimeter blocking for this observable. This allows Enterprise 2 to use this behavior information sharing for blocking purposes even if the attacker changes their source address. So since these COAs have already been ingested by this enterprise's social instance, what an operator can then do is either manually download each object in Stix XML format or extract them from a pre-setup feed using a taxi client script. At this point, the user would have to develop an orchestrator workflow using the COA information. So now the attacker is trying the same attack that they had tried against Enterprise 1, against Enterprise 3. The only difference is they are now serving up the malicious website from this new IP address. So Enterprise 1 has shared the snort alerts to look for that are indicative of the attack and then the response to take if you see those alerts. And so Enterprise 3 has encoded that in an Invitas workflow which is going to watch for the alerts and then take the appropriate action if it sees them. So as soon as the user goes to the malicious website now, the alerts are generated um, the workflow runs and the attacker address is blocked. In this demonstration, we will show the capability of the queuing edition of the Informatica Ultra Messaging product as it relates to supporting the notion of an IACD message fabric. In our message bus implementation, we utilized the transport type that consisted of a broker to handle messages sent between endpoints within a specific enterprise. This allowed any number of endpoints to communicate asynchronously without needing knowledge of each other in order to publish or subscribe, also referred to as PubSub, under a given queue or topic. This also provided visual tracking of the data exchange through the product's dashboard and modularity for the components of the environment to be separated and recombined if necessary. A topic in queue from the client perspective is just a name, but the difference is how the other side, the broker in our case, treats the messages. Multiple subscribers using a single queue produces a round-robin type of distribution of the messages. On the other hand, messages published to a topic will be copied to each subscriber. 
Here we will use Informatica's variation of a queue called a composite destination, also known as a virtual queue, which signifies a virtual message destination representing a collection of physical queues. Use of this variation provides an environment where many consumers can subscribe to a single queue, which behaves as a topic and will be referred to as such throughout this demonstration. In our instance, Snort, an intrusion detection system, is the publisher. The security orchestration tools Phantom Enterprise and Invitas Security Orchestrator, as well as the Splunk Security Information and Event Management Tool, or SIM for short, are the subscribers. These are not tools that natively support communication across a message bus, so we developed adapters to standardize all of the data being passed into Common Event Format, or CEPH, before sending to and receiving from the message bus. Using these tools, we will demonstrate a few of the main concepts of the functionality of this message bus solution while leveraging the ability to have multiple subscribers on a topic simultaneously. This functionality includes durable subscriptions, message persistence, and retroactive delivery. The ability to swap subscribers in and out of the message bus means that any number of subscribers can be receiving and processing the same information at any given time and can be disconnected from the message bus without affecting any of the other subscribers. Behind the scenes, intrusion alerts are being generated, processed, and published to the orchestrator topic on the message bus. For the purposes of clarity and repeatability, these messages are sent out at a continuous and consistent rate of one per second. The Phantom Orchestrator is the first to subscribe to the orchestrator topic and begins receiving alerts. We will show that while Phantom is the initial receiver of the snort alerts being generated and passed over the message bus, Invitas and Splunk can come along later and start receiving messages. This feature is important because it shows flexibility in communications combined with zero downtime associated with network reconfiguration. Next, the Invitas orchestrator subscribes to the topic and begins receiving the same alerts that Phantom is receiving. We have the orchestrator dashboard web pages refreshing every one to two seconds to show the increasing count as this occurs. Now we'll have Splunk subscribe to the topic to receive the same alerts. You can see the alerts now coming in at a steady pace as the page scrolls showing the details of the data being consumed. This shows that any number of consumers can be subscribed to a given topic, receiving copies of the same data at the same point in time, which demonstrates the interoperability and modularity that the messaging solution supplies to this enterprise. Durable subscriptions allows a client subscribed to a given topic to go offline and receive a copy of all of the buffered messages sent to the topic once it comes back online. Configuration parameters allow message limits and other specifics to be customized and set if desired. After Splunk has received a number of messages, we are killing Splunk's subscription process, simulating a hard disconnect of a subscriber. Notice that Splunk itself is still running, but no messages are arriving. The durability of this message bus implementation allows the server running Splunk to die off for a period of time and during this time the messages meant for this subscriber are being buffered at the broker. As you'll see over in the broker's dashboard view, the count representing buffered messages is slowly but steadily increasing while awaiting the subscriber's return. Once Splunk's network connectivity is restored and it has subscribed to the topic again, you can now see the messages coming in that were missed while the Splunk subscriber was offline, in addition to those currently being sent. Notice back on the dashboard that the buffered messages were successfully transmitted through the message bus and are being sent to Splunk. While we simulated an equipment failure here, this just as easily could have been a network connectivity issue. Overall, this demonstrates the ability for the environment to recover and continue operating through nuisance disruptions. Message persistence allows the broker to write messages to disk back storage or a database, offering the assurance that even if the broker goes down, any messages that were sent but not received by intended subscribers prior to the broker's outage will be stored until the broker is back up. Once the broker is back online and the subscribers resubscribe to the topic, the broker resumes sending messages, ensuring subscribers successfully receive them.
Using Splunk again, we are able to show the persistence capability implemented within this message bus instantiation through a crash of the broker in similar failure situations. First, we will take down Splunk's message bus connectivity, wait for a couple of messages to get buffered, and then we will take down the broker. While we are waiting, note here on the broker dashboard that a couple of messages were already in queued and had not been dequeued by the Splunk subscriber. We are now bringing the broker down off screen to simulate an unexpected broker failure, shown here by the fact that the broker dashboard is no longer accessible. After bringing the broker back up, which you can see by the returning of the broker dashboard, the messages are still in queued and can be consumed by the Splunk subscriber once it resubscribes. Without the implementation of this persistence capability, all messages in transit would be lost if the broker process died. The broker's ability to recall messages that were still in the queue after crashing or going offline is a good method for message resilience if the broker is down or if subscribers are unable to handle messages at a given time. Taking a slightly different approach from the virtual queue structure, we will be employing topics within the Informatica Message Bus product to provide the additional capability to support a new retroactive subscriber being able to receive any old messages that were sent prior to the start of his subscription. This provides flexibility of the receivers of the data being passed around within the, within the enterprise. A new orchestrator topic has been created at the broker. As seen here, both Phantom and Invitas are already subscribed to the orchestrator topic and receiving messages. A brand new subscriber represented here by Splunk can come along later and receive the same messages that the already active subscribers were consuming. This allows us to anticipate that we might need retroactive abilities on our topics for an unknown number of subscribers without having advanced knowledge of how many times or which applications will be subscribing. These features that we have chosen to highlight come together to support the idea of a unified message fabric for the integrated adaptive cyber defense environment, maintaining the goals of interoperability and in-transit data resilience. In this demonstration, we will show the capability of the Apache ActiveMQ message bus as it relates to supporting the notion of an IACD message fabric. In our message bus implementation, we utilize a transport type that consists of a broker to handle messages sent between endpoints within the specific enterprise. This allowed any number of endpoints to communicate asynchronously without needing knowledge of each other in order to publish or subscribe, also referred to as pub-sub, under a given QR topic. This also provided visual tracking of the data exchange through the product's dashboard and modularity for the components of the environment to be separated and recombined if necessary. A topic or queue from the client perspective is just a name, but the difference is how the other side, the broker in our case, treats the messages. Multiple subscribers using a single queue produces a round robin type of distribution of the messages. On the other hand, messages published to a topic will be copied to each subscriber. In our instance, Snort, an intrusion detection system, is the publisher. The security orchestration tools Phantom Enterprise and Invitas Security Orchestrator as well as the Splunk Security Information and Event Management Tool, or SIM for short, are the subscribers. These are not tools that natively support communication across a message bus, so we developed adapters to standardize all of the data being passed into a common event format, or CEPH, before sending and receiving from the message bus. Using these tools, we will demonstrate a few of the main concepts of the functionality of this message bus solution, while leveraging the ability to have multiple subscribers on a topic simultaneously. This functionality includes a durable subscriptions and message persistence. The ability to swap subscribers in and out of the message bus means that any number of subscribers can be receiving and processing the same information at any given time and can be disconnected from the message bus without affecting any of the other subscribers. Behind the scenes, intrusion alerts are being generated, processed, and published to the orchestrator topic on the message bus. For the purposes of clarity and repeatability, these messages are sent out at a continuous and consistent rate of one per second. The Fam Phantom Orchestrator is the first to subscribe to the orchestrator topic and begins receiving the alerts. We will show that while Phantom is the initial receiver of the snort alerts being generated and passed over the message bus, Invitas and Splunk can come along later and start receiving messages. This feature is important because it shows the flexibility and communications combined with zero downtime associated with network reconfiguration. Next, the Invitas Orchestrator subscribes to the topic and begins receiving the same alerts that Phantom is receiving. We have the orchestrator dashboard web pages refreshing every one to two seconds to show the increasing count as this occurs. 
now will have Splunk subscribed to this topic and re to receive these same alerts. You can see the alerts coming in at a steady pace as the page scrolls, showing the details of the data being consumed. This shows that any number of consumers can be subscribed to a given topic, receiving copies of the same data at the same point in time, which demonstrates the interoperability and modularity that the messaging solution supplies to this enterprise. Durable Subscriptions allows a client subscribed to a given topic to go offline and receive a copy of all the buffered messages sent to the topic once it comes back online. Configuration parameters allow message limits and other specifics to be customized and set, if desired. After Splunk has received a number of messages, we are killing Splunk's subscription process, simulating a harsh disconnect of a subscriber. Notice that Splunk itself is still running, but no messages are arriving. The durability of this message bus implementation allows the server running Splunk to die off for a period of time, and during this time the messages meant for the subscriber are being buffered at the broker. As you'll see over in the broker's dashboard view, the count representing the buffered messages is slowly and steadily increasing as I refresh the page while re awaiting the subscriber's return. Once Splunk's network connectivity is restored and it has subscribed to the topic again, you can now see the messages coming in that were missed whilst the Splunk subscriber was offline, in addition to those currently being sent. Notice back on the dashboard that the buffered messages were successfully transmitted through the message bus and are being sent to Splunk. While we simulated an equipment failure here, this just as easily could have been a network connectivity issue. Overall, this demonstrates the ability for the environment to recover and continue operating through nuisance disruptions. Message persistence allows the broker to write messages to disk back storage or a database, offering the insurance that even if the broker goes down, any messages that were sent but not received by intended subscribers prior to the broker's outage will be stored until the broker is back up. Once the broker is back online and the subscribers resubscribe to the topic, the broker resumes sending messages ensuring subscribers successfully receive them. Using Splunk again, we are able to show the persistence capability implemented within this message bus instantiation through a crash of the broker in similar failure situations. First, we will take down Splunk's message bus connectivity, wait for a couple of messages to get buffered, and then take down the broker. While we are waiting, note here on the broker dashboard that a number of messages were already in queued and had not been dequeued by the Splunk subscriber. We are now bringing the broker down off screen to simulate it an unexpected broker failure, shown here by the fact that broker dashboard is no longer accessible. After bringing the broker back up, which you can see by the returning of the broker dashboard, the messages are still in queued and can be consumed by the Splunk subscriber once it resubscribes. Without the implementation of the, this persistence capability, all messages in transit would be lost if the broker process died. The broker's ability to recall messages that were still in the queue after crashing or going offline is a good method for message resilience if the broker is down or subscribers are unable to handle messages at a given time. In this demonstration, we will show the capability of the TIBCO Enterprise Messaging Service as it relates to supporting the notion of an IACD message fabric. In our message bus implementation, we utilize a transport type that consists of a broker to handle messages sent between endpoints within the specific enterprise. This allowed any number of endpoints to communicate asynchronously without needing knowledge of each other in order to publish or subscribe, also referred to as pub sub under a given queue or topic. This provided visual tracking of the data exchange through the product's dashboard and modularity for the components of the environment to be separated and recombined if necessary. A topic in queue from the client perspective is just a name, but the difference is how the other side, the broker in our case, treats the messages. Multiple subscribers using a single queue produces a round robin distribution of the messages. On the other hand, messages published to a topic will be copied to each subscriber. In our instance, Snort, an intrusion detection system, is the publisher. The security orchestration tools Phantom Enterprise, Inventus Security Orchestrator, as well as the Splunk Security Information and Event Management Tool, or SIM for short, are the subscribers. These are not tools that natively support communication across a message bus, so we developed adapters to standardize all of the data being passed into common event format, or CEPH, before sending to and receiving from the message bus. Using these tools, we will demonstrate a few of the main concept of the functionality of this message bus solution, while leveraging the ability to have multiple subscribers on a topic simultaneously. This functionality includes durable subscriptions and message persistence.
The ability to swap subscribers in and out of the message bus means that any number of subscribers can be receiving and processing the same information at any given time and can be disconnected from the message bus without affecting any of these subscribers. Behind the scenes, intrusion alerts are being generated, processed, and published to the orchestrator topic on the message bus. For the purposes of clarity and repeatability, these messages are sent out at a continuous and consistent rate of one per second. The Phantom Orchestrator is the first to subscribe to the orchestrator topic and begins receiving the alerts. We will show that while Phantom is the initial receiver of the snort alerts being generated and passed over the message bus, Invitas and Splunk can come along later and start receiving messages. This feature is important because it shows flexibility and communication combined with zero downtime associated with network reconfiguration. Next, the Invitas Orchestrator subscribes to the topic and begins receiving the same alerts that Phantom is receiving. We have the Orchestrator dashboard web pages refreshing every 1-2 to two seconds to show the increasing count as this occurs. Now we'll have Splunk subscribe to this topic to receive these same alerts. You can see the alerts coming in at a steady pace as the page scrolls showing the details of the data being consumed. This shows that any number of consumers can be subscribed to a given topic, receiving copies of the same data at the same point in time, which demonstrates the interoperability and the modularity that the messaging solution supplies to this enterprise. Durable Subscriptions allows a client subscribed to a given topic to go offline and receive a copy of all the buffered messages sent to the topic once it comes back online. Configuration parameters allow message limits and other specifics to be customized and set if desired. After Splunk has received a number of messages, we are killing Splunk's subscription process, simulating a harsh disconnect of the subscriber. Notice that Splunk itself is still running, but no messages are arriving. The durability of this message bus implementation allows the server running Splunk to die off for a period of time, and during this time, the messages meant for the subscriber are being buffered at the broker. Once Splunk's network connectivity is restored and has subscribed to the topic again, you can now see the messages coming in that were missed while Splunk the Splunk subscriber was offline, in addition to those being currently sent. While we simulated an equipment failure here, this just as easily could have been a network connectivity issue. Overall, this demonstrates the ability for the environment to recover and continue operating through nuisance disruptions. Message persistence allows the broker to write messages to disk back storage or a database, offering the assurance that even if the broker goes down, any messages that were sent but not received by the intended subscribers prior to the broker's outage will be stored until the broker is back up. Once the broker is back online and the subscribers resubscribe to the topic, the broker resumes sending messages ensuring subscribers successfully receive them. Using Splunk again, we are able to show the persistence capability implemented within this message bus instantiation through a crash of the broker and similar failure sessions. First, we will take down Splunk's message bus connectivity, wait for a couple of messages to get buffered, and then we will take down the broker. While we are waiting, notice, note on the broker dashboard that a number of messages were already in queued and had not been dequeued by the Splunk subscriber. We are now bringing the broker down off screen to simulate an unexpected broker failure, shown here by the fact that the broker dashboard is no longer accessible. After bringing the broker back up, which you can see by the returning of the broker dashboard, the messages are still in queued and can be consumed by the Splunk subscriber once it resubscribes. Without the implementation of this persistence of capability, all messages in transit would be lost if the broker process died. The broker's ability to recall messages that were still in the queue after crashing or going offline is a good method for message resilience if the broker is down or if the subscribers are unable to handle the messages at a given time.
Another use case that we explored is the automation of patch management. Currently, this is something that can be automated to some degree given a vendor ecosystem, but there are advantages to enabling security orchestration to command patch management in a standard manner. In our example, we have a small scenario implemented to exercise some OpenC2 commands. In this case, stop, update, and start. Microsoft System Center Configuration Manager was also used in this scenario as the patch management component. Implementation of OpenC2 commands to enable automation involved leveraging PowerShell integrated with commandlets provided by SECM itself. Here is a high-level view of the workflow that we will demonstrate shortly. Phantom sends stop to IIS to stop the web server, then sends an update to the System Center Configuration Manager to patch IIS, and then finally Phantom sends a start command to bring IIS online. We have a preset scenario in the form of a phantom playbook that kicks off this automated workflow. We will show what it looks like to kick off the scenario as well as the listening endpoint for these OpenC2 commands. If you take a closer look at the listener, you'll see that these are JSON representation of OpenC2 commands. Shown here is the update command, which specifies IIS to be updated by SECM. Then we will go back and see what is happening on the endpoints. So here you can see the deployment for IIS stop. When we refresh, you can see that the deployment for stop is queued up. When we move to the software updates in the IAS patch collection, you can see all of these patches have been determined as required for the IAS server. Finally, we will go to packages and move to start. In start, when we move to the deployments, you can see that the start is also queued up. Moving to the IAS server, take note that all of these packages are outdated. In the corner, you'll see the deployment for updating the server is taking effect. As we open the software center and click on the installation status, the various updates are shown to be installing. Once the updates are complete, some will require a restart. Windows will automatically prompt you for a restart. After the restart is complete, we'll look at the installed updates once again. Now that the machine is restarted, we can move over to the installed updates and notice all of the new updates from 2016. Thank you for your interest and thanks for watching. Another use case to test automating proactive defensive actions is the command task order, or the CTO. This type of scenario is common in hierarchical environments such as the DoD. This involves a directive being sent from a greater authority down to a subordinate tier. A CTO is a common real-life situation that would be valuable if fully automated. Within the scope of OpenC2, this could be represented by a more generic command passing from a higher tier to a lower tier. In our case, remediate. Conceptually, this would be implemented by an orchestrator-to-orchestrator -orchestrator communication. It begins with a single OpenC2 command, remediate, transmitted from Invitas to Phantom. This command specifies what to remediate, but not how to do so. It is left to the subordinate orchestrator to determine the best course of action. When Phantom receives this command, the logic in the playbook understands that the local domain is a Windows environment. Phantom proceeds by tasking Microsoft System Center Configuration Manager via an OpenC2 set command to create and deploy a group policy object. Before we move to the execution of the demo, we will show the endpoint state before the remediate OpenC2 action is executed. On the right, we have the group policy management window open to show that there is currently no group policy in the block auto run folder of the current domain. As we move over to the terminal, when we query the endpoint for the group policy objects, you'll see that the block auto run policy doesn't yet exist in the applied group policy objects. Below, inside the registry editor, the value for block auto run does not yet exist. Now onto the orchestrator section, I'm going to be simulating the creation of the CTO message that will be disseminated to the lower tiers. You'll see immediately that a case has shown up in Invitas. Moving into the cases, the automated workflow has already been run and kicked off the actions for our simulated block auto run test scenario. While we are moving to Phantom, Please note that this entire process has been automated and we're exploring the artifacts that this workflow has left behind. Refreshing the incident page in Phantom, I can click on the incident and show that the playbook has already run on it. Before moving over to SCCM, we'll take a look at the artifact created by this incident. When we open the artifact to examine its contents, shown here is a stig ID for blocking auto run as well as the raw open C2 command. Over on SCCM, the listener has already parsed and executed this OpenC2 command. Let us take a closer look at the listener and the command that was received.
you can see here that this is a JSON representation of an OpenC2 command for the action set. Notice the method of the OpenC2 command has a stig ID for blocking autorun. Back in the configuration manager, after the command has been executed, you can see that SCCM has listed a deployment for the block autorun action. As it may take up to 90 minutes for the endpoint to automatically check in with the DC, for the purpose of the demonstration, we will manually refresh the group policy on the endpoint. Inside the group policy window, you'll see that the previously empty folder for the block autorun test is now populated. As we refresh the group policy once again and look inside the details of this policy, we can drill down and click on show all and see that the default autorun behavior is set to do not execute any autorun commands. Back in the registry editor, you can see that the key for no autorun is set to 1. This concludes the demonstration of the workflow for the command task order utilizing orchestrator to orchestrator communications and command enrichment for the OpenC2 remediate command. Thank you for your interest and thanks for watching. Welcome to the OpenC2 use case demonstration series. In this video, we will be exploring a web drive by scenario. This use case leverages the OpenC2 language to respond to a simulated web drive by attack. Several OpenC2 actions are used to exercise various actuators and actuator types. Furthermore, this use case explores chaining OpenC2 actions by using the response from one action to trigger additional OpenC2 actions. Although we realize that not all organizations are comfortable with automation, this scenario provides a proof of concept of how OpenC2 can be used to automate cyber defense. This use case was developed using the 0.5 draft specification of the OpenC2 language. First, let's take a look at an overview of our attack scenario. In this scenario, we use a Kali Linux machine along with Cobalt Strike as our threat emulation platform. The attacker sets up a web server with some malicious content. During the first phase of the attack, spear phishing emails are sent to individuals within the enterprise. An unsuspecting user clicks on a link in one of those emails, allowing the attacker to gain a foothold in the enterprise. In the second phase of the attack, our simulated threat actor performs some process migration as well as privilege escalation. This results in the attacker obtaining system level credentials on the initial victim's machine. Proceeding with the third phase of the attack, the attacker uses the initial victim's machine and some stolen credentials to distribute malware to additional endpoints within the enterprise. Once the malware is executed, additional command and control channels are established allowing the attacker to move laterally. Now that we have an overview of the attack scenario, let's take a look at how the defense will respond. The defense starts with the SNORT network intrusion detection system, which will detect artifacts from the attack. The sensor data is forwarded to Splunk, which is configured to create an incident in the Phantom Cyber Security Orchestrator. The Phantom incident triggers a workflow to execute which issues the investigate command to perform a reputation lookup using the virus total service. Additionally, a query command is issued to Carbon Black to find processes associated with the artifact. The results of the query triggers a copy command to be issued to Carbon Black, resulting in the associated binary executable being copied to a protected location for forensics. When the copy command is successful, it triggers a detonate command to be sent to Cuckoo, a detonation sandbox. The binary executable copied from our endpoint will be detonated to look for additional artifacts. If the phantom workflow determines that there are command and control channels established by an attacker, a deny command is issued to the firewall to block the suspected source address. For this scenario, we are simply adding a rule to IP tables. A stop command is also issued to Carbon Black to kill any processes with connections to the suspected attacker. The restart command is then issued to Carbon Black to reboot any affected endpoints. As part of a cleanup effort, Phantom Cyber issues the locate command to Carbon Black to hunt for files matching a given hash across the enterprise. The result of the locate command triggers a delete action using Carbon Black to remove the malicious files. This slide shows the entire defensive workflow in response to the web drive-by attack, including Snort as a sensor, Splunk as the seam, Phantom Cyber as a security orchestrator, as well as various actuators. Note that all of the OpenC2 actions are highlighted in red. Furthermore, at the time this use case was developed, OpenC2 was a draft specification. 
thus none of the tools listed supported the language. Therefore, software shims were created to encode and decode the OpenC2 messages. These shims also provided functionality to send and receive OpenC2 messages via a message service. Although not depicted here, this scenario uses the ActiveMQ message broker along with the Stomp Transport protocol as the message service. This table provides a list of the OpenC2 actions used in this scenario, as well as the actuators involved, and a brief description of how the action was utilized. Now let's take a look at the scenario in action. On the screen are two windows. First is the Cobalt Strike application showing the attacker's perspective. Overlaid on top of that is a timeline showing the events from both the attack and defense. As indicated by the Windows icon highlighted in red, Cobalt Strike has established a new interpreter session with the victim of the web drive attack. This results in the defense issuing the investigate and query OpenC2 actions. Following the query action, a copy OpenC2 action retrieves the associated binary executable. Proceeding with the next phase of the attack, the threat actor executes a script to perform a process migration and privilege escalation using the bypass UAC Metasploit module. At this point, we can see that an additional interpreter session with escalated privileges has been established with the original victim. This triggers the defense to issue additional query OpenC2 actions. Continuing with the attack, a interpreter shell is used to get system level privileges as well as add routes to the next victim. The attacker then proceeds to steal some credentials from the initial victim's machine. Using these stolen credentials, the attacker attempts to move laterally to another endpoint using the PSExec Metasploit module to distribute and execute malware from the initial victim's machine. With the appearance of a second Windows icon highlighted in red, we can see that a interpreter session with system level privileges has been established on an additional endpoint, completing the attacker's lateral movement. The defense takes immediate action by issuing a deny OpenC2 action, as well as additional investigate and query actions. As the defensive workflow continues, a stop command is issued to kill the processes connected to the attacker. Additionally, a restart OpenC2 action is sent to reboot the affected endpoints. Finally, the reboot of the endpoints causes the attacker to lose the established interpreter sessions. The defense continues to clean up by issuing the locate and delete OpenC2 actions. This concludes the demonstration. Thanks for watching. If you have questions about the OpenC2, please visit their website at openc2.org. For questions regarding this scenario or the Integrated Adaptive Cyber Defense Project at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, please email iacd at jhuapl.edu. This is a demonstration of advanced analytic capabilities in a multi-region environment. The Gray Limb Enterprise has offices in two locations, New York City and Los Angeles. The offices are on separate networks connected with a VPN. Each office has a local snort intrusion detection system, a phantom orchestrator, and a firewall to analyze network traffic and defend against cyber threats. For a multi-regional defense, the Alien Vault platform correlates the snort alerts and coordinates with a multi-region Invitas orchestrator. With multiple networks, there can be simultaneous attacks in multiple locations. The attack may be small enough that it isn't detected by either of the local orchestrators with enough confidence to respond. By sharing information between environments and performing centralized analysis, we can see the full attack and detect it with higher confidence. When a multi-region attack is detected, the multi-region orchestrator notifies the local orchestrators, which are responsible for mitigating the attack. The attacker targets both regions simultaneously with an Nmap scan. Without advanced analytics, a scan would succeed, and the local enterprises would fail to detect the coordinated attack. With advanced analytics, the same attack is detected, and the local orchestrators respond by creating firewall rules to block the adversary. So, how are the advanced analytics actually implemented and integrated with the rest of the enterprise? Let's walk through the full scenario. The attacker scans the enterprise, targeting hosts in both locations. 
a snort intrusion detection system runs on each host. It sees the scans and produces alerts, which are sent to Alien Vault. Hosts in Los Angeles send alerts directly to Alien Vault. All hosts in New York send alerts through the SSH VPN. The advanced analytic platform is Alien Vault Unified Security Management. It ingests the snort alerts and shows them in the web interface. These are the alerts produced by the Nmap scan. Alien Vault's rules correlate events and generate alarms. Rules like this one can detect attacks targeting multiple locations. Alien Vault's alarm view shows the attack details, such as IPs, ports, the time, and links to events. When an alarm is generated, Alien Vault sends a message to the Invitas multi region orchestrator. Invitas receives the message and processes it with a custom playbook. The message contains details including the attack type, severity, and IPs. It uses a custom plugin to forward this information to the regional Phantom orchestrators. Phantom gets the message from Invitas on its REST API interface. This is an example of orchestrator to orchestrator communication between Invitas and Phantom. A custom Phantom playbook tells the orchestrator how to respond to the Invitas message. In the playbook, the Phantom orchestrators create regional firewall rules, blocking the attacker's IP. Now the regional firewalls block traffic from the adversary, and further scans are unsuccessful. Multi-region enterprises face unique threats. Protecting them against coordinated attacks requires coordinated analysis. Centralized analysis with tools like Alien Vault can detect these high-risk attacks with more confidence and mitigate cyber threats.